general, there are many human diseases that unfortunately are caused by the loss of, of particular populations of cells. And this includes anything from type 1 diabetes in which people have lost the population of cells that secrete insulin through a number of blinding diseases, for example, retinitis pigmentosa, which is caused by the loss of the, the light sensing population of neurons within our eye, unfortunately. Parkinson's is caused by the loss of a population of cells within the brain known as dopamine neurons or dopaminergic neurons. And in each one of these situations, unfortunately, the disease that's caused by the death of cells ends up being very difficult to treat but because by the time it's diagnosed, a lot of damage has already been done. So the goal in, for this set of projects that we have within our lab is, and uh, the field is very excited about such approaches in general, is uh, why not use stem cells as a potentially plentiful source of replacement cells because stem cells have two defining properties. They can divide or, or grow or expand in number indefinitely, and then they can differentiate or be coaxed or, or convinced to differentiate or specialize into the cell types that we may need in order to replace the ones that have been lost or damaged due to disease or injury. So the experiments that, uh, that I think you've observed that are ongoing within the lab, our group is very focused in on the central nervous system because there's a huge amount of unmet medical need, a large number of diseases in which people have lost massive numbers of neurons, unfortunately. For example, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, as well as diseases within the eye like retinitis pigmentosa. So our group is very interested in understanding, first of all, at a very basic level, what are some mechanisms that control the differentiation of stem cells into these important populations of neurons? And second, how can we scale that? How can we um, increase the scale of processes to create these cells so that we can begin to meet the large numbers of cells that would be needed, the demand for large numbers of cells that would be needed to treat human patients? Now, the focus for our work primarily is on, on treating clear situations where, where function has been lost within tissues due to disease or injury. Um, the field as a whole is, you know, at least uh, thinks about or considers the idea of you know, performance enhancement. That really kind of goes beyond my, my gray area for what I would consider to be ethically reasonable and acceptable. Um, I think that uh, I'm interested in treating people who are sick. I'm not, not interested in, you know, treating people who are healthy. Sure, there are really four categories of stem cell research. There's adult versus embryonic, and then there's animal versus human. So for animal research, you know, there, there's still some controversy associated with that, but most people in this country aren't vegetarians. So, you know, by extension, I think that there's at least somewhat of a comfort level with, uh, with conducting research on uh, stem cells derived from animal sources. And in addition, adult is not considered to be controversial because uh, um, it's possible to derive um, stem cell populations from, from donors who have passed away and by the same idea that they would donate their cells for organ um, transplantations to treat uh, people who may, may need a liver transplant or a heart transplant. In many situations, they're donating tissues for scientific study and stem cells can be isolated from those. The, the one quadrant that ends up being ethically controversial is the intersection between embryonic and human. So up until um, somewhat recently, the best way you could generate a pluripotent stem cell, where pluripotent is a, is a word that simply means a stem cell that has the ability to differentiate or turn into every single cell type in the body, as opposed to an adult stem cell, which tends to be multipotent, can only turn into the cell types within that tissue from which it's derived. Um, up until recently, the best way to derive a pluripotent stem cell has been from, from an embryo, a human embryo. So one question is, where do you get these embryos? Uh, so in vitro fertilization has been going on for about 36 years or so, and as a result of that, um, every time a couple goes in for IVF, they generate more embryos than are needed to, to conceive a child. So they freeze the leftovers, put it down in liquid nitrogen, and over 36 years of, an, of IVF, the country has accumulated over 400,000 embryos. So some parents are now, you know, 36 years is, is a long time. Some of these parents may have been in their 30s at the time that they did IVF. Now they're in their 70s. They're, they're done having kids. So the question then becomes, what do you do with the leftover embryos? And in some situations, the parents were going to destroy the embryos and decided to donate them to science instead. And as a result of that, uh, investigators were, starting in 1998, able to, to derive human embryonic stem cells from these embryos and have created a number of lines that the field uses. Uh, so we use several within our own lab. These have been um, created with 
Uh, proper consent, meaning the parents have signed informed consent, indicating that they know what the cells are going to be used for, uh, that the identity of the, of the donor is, is fully anonymous, and as a result, the, the ethical concerns are really, at least within scientific circles and bioethics circles, pretty minimal. Uh, how recently there have been new ways developed to create pluripotent stem cells that don't require touching a human embryo. And uh, the field of induced pluripotency, for example, was born in, in 2006 with some ingenious work by a Japanese investigator by, by the name of Shinya Yamanaka. And he showed that you could take any adult stem cell, or sorry, any adult cell, and introduce some key genes into it, genes that are produced within or expressed within human embryonic stem cells, and as a result, reboot that adult cell into thinking it's an embryonic cell. And uh, this is called induced pluripotency, and the field uh, has generated many, many induced pluripotent stem cell lines. We've created our own. And so this doesn't involve touching any embryos whatsoever, and uh, as a result, it's, it's significantly less ethically controversial. And our work is really focused on trying to understand the mechanisms by which these cells make differentiation decisions so that we can control or guide their differentiation into the therapeutically relevant populations of cells. And then our, our group is also very interested in, in understanding how to scale the differentiation of these cells because um, it's one thing to do it in a dish, but if we want to treat one million Parkinson's patients, each of whom needs a million cells, then the scaling problem becomes very, very challenging. So we're very interested in human embryonic stem cells and how to turn them into particular populations of cells that can be implanted. And then furthermore, the second population of cells that we're interested in is endogenous stem cells that exist within the adult brain. So it was discovered back in the, uh, the early to mid-1990s, and before that it was thought that the adult brain is something that's fixed, has um, a certain number of neurons, and you can only lose them, you can't add new ones. But it was discovered in the mid-1990s that the human brain... Um, and mammalian brains in general actually harbor populations of stem cells, not everywhere, but in a couple of regions, that have the ability to continuously divide and generate new neurons um, throughout human life. So we create something like 700 new neurons in our brains every single day. So they're there for a particular reason. You know, biology wants to use these cells to, to, uh, to modulate and to control processes of learning and memory. However, their existence really raises the idea or the possibility that perhaps we can actually harness them and control them and coax them into doing things that maybe biology didn't intend them to do, but maybe we can use them for regenerating the brain from the effects of neurodegenerative disease. So these are two parallel avenues that our group works on, trying to work with pluripotent stem cells, generate cells outside the body and implant them, or to harness endogenous cells that already exist inside the brain and retask them uh, towards regenerating tissue.